it's uh, I was playing a game and I rolled uh, I was a ranger and I rolled for perception, got a natural twenty and had like a a bonus of like I don't know thirty five or something. It was crazy. You had sight beyond sight. Uh, it was it was crazy. <laughs> and uh, the the DM looks at me and he's like, for a moment. You look around and all your allies are inanimate objects. <laughs> there are dice strewn upon the table around you. You look up and you see these large figures all staring down at you. And you shake your head and close your eyes and everything's back to normal. You saw behind the veal. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, did I see the trap or not? He's like, there's no trap. I'm like, oh, well, now I have to act this out. My guy is deeply confused and needs a day of rest existential, yeah. existential crisis yeah exactly <laughs> it cracked me up man it was such a good time but brandon foreman thank you so much for joining me man, on the something pleasure. nothing everything podcast you're welcome it's thank wild a uh, little background to you uh work for a library system uh been in the library system since you were 16 14 14 yes okay and you are currently 32 years old now yes so you've been effectively in that system longer than you were alive before it. Yeah, absolutely. So you spent more time working for libraries than That's, you have not. I've never actually put that together. That's very clever. Yeah, absolutely. That's I have. wild, man. Yeah. Uh, went to school, undergrad, psychology, focused yep. in child psychology, mm -hmm. and then went to your master's degree program in? Master's of Library and Information Science. Okay, yeah. right on. Where'd you go to school at? Uh, San Jose State, uh, online program for them. Oh, right on. Yeah. And your bachelor's degree program, same thing? Oh, uh, no. Bachelor's was in person at the University of Central Florida, um, right there in Orlando. Those are Gators? Uh, no, they are the Knights. The Knights? Yeah. Who are the Gators? Gators are UF, which my wife is, University of Florida. She was a Gator. Do you guys like butt? Oh, yeah. Bump heads a lot? Yeah. Um, actually, many, when we first started dating, we wanted to go see her old stomping ground, so we went to UF. And as we're walking around, there was a group touring uh, for new students, and somebody had a UCF shirt, which was my college, and I said, "Oh, go Knights!" Immediately, my wife just got me right in the stomach, <laughs> and the whole tour group looks over as I exaggerate. I go, oh, yeah. oh my God! And somebody call an ambulance! <laughs> and she says, "You don't say that on these sacred lands." <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you, uh, I'm assuming you started working out in Florida. Yes. Right. Yeah, absolutely. What? Uh, 14 years old. That's middle school or high school. Freshman. Going into high school, freshman year of high school. Okay. So what sparked your curiosity for the library system? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, it kind of cliche, but for me as a kid at a younger age, yeah. um, going through some hard times, the library was a safe place for me. It was okay. a place where I felt welcome to the, by the adults, um, somewhere that I could go be there for large portions of the day where I'm not expected to spend money or they're trying to gain something out of me. They just wanted to support me. And my natural love for reading information and just having access to as much information as possible. That's what the library did for me. So there was a place I could go there, but I don't want to pretend that everything was academically inclined or for my betterment. Sometimes I was just going on the computers there and playing uh, halo combat involved with land matches with my friends in the library too. Yeah. But all those positive associations I got to have with that location. Yeah. I remember land parties. We broke through my high school firewall. <laughs> uh, shout out to John Fay and Will Frazier. Uh, we, <clears throat> cause you know how schools have those firewalls. So you couldn't get to certain. Oh, of course. Key, yeah, they, so, they block out based on keywords yeah, and things that they picked so up on. We ended up getting like 20 people cause it's all one land. Like it's all one server in the high school. Right. So we, uh, we all got through it via like a, a virtual machine stuff. Mm -hmm. Dude, we play Halo almost every single class that we had. A, a, had a computer. Man. And we would just jump in to active servers going on at the school anyway oh man so uh i didn't have to go to a library for that i do wish i <laughs> i do dude i gotta i gotta tell you when i moved when i moved here um i i was not really big into libraries i would use them for like audiobooks mm -hmm. especially just given my job driving around in a car all day i needed something to listen to and podcasts were a portion of that but then i was like man i i need to expand my my knowledge mm -hmm. right like the curiosity feeding that yeah um, feeding that, that itch. Um, so the library system, my, inter my interaction prior to moving here was just Minim getting, yeah. The minimal. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. One, I would, I would, I literally walked into a library, got a library card just to be able to do the audiobooks. Yes. And then when I move out here to see how much you guys are doing for the community, it, it, 
literally blew me away because I've never seen that before in my life. And I appreciate hearing you say that. And that's uh, funny enough. I think that a um, a lot of longtime library professionals who've been in it for a while, I think they forget at times just how many people aren't visiting the library regularly and it's not a regular used service by them. Um, I think some professionals in the field get stuck in thinking, oh, of course, we're the uh, hot commodity that hot commodity that everybody wants to use. Yeah. But there's still, if you look at how many people are not utilizing their local libraries and unaware of the vast amount of resources they have, um, earlier, you and I were talking about, you know, the Oculus and whatnot. Yeah. Um, you know, when I mention to people when they're first coming into the libraries and I tell them, oh, if you want, you can check out the Oculus Quest. They're like, wait, you check out virtual reality headsets? I was like, oh, yeah, for sure. And then if you want to come sign up for uh, Yoga with Baby Goats after that, we got something like that, too. You know, libraries, they just, if they wanted to survive and thrive, they had to adapt and evolve. They couldn't just be a location of resources anymore. And those resources are valuable, but you have to have more. So why was that? So in, in going to your master's degree, I'm assuming you did some sort of history of libraries. Oh, of course, you go into so, it. Like, let's let's rewind because I'm I'm a history nut mm -hmm. and and I love uh, if you could impart some knowledge on the listeners as oh. far as like the knowledge of libraries. When did they? When was when was the storing of this information really made? Uh, we'll we'll go back to the point where it was really for the elites to made public. All right, absolutely. So it depends on what you look at too. It depends on what kind of scale you look at. If you look out here in America, which is a relatively young country, you know, comparatively speaking. Um, you can find things as late as the 1800s. A lot of times libraries were started from local community groups. Um, I was actually just, oh, which library system it was. I was reading about this wonderful library that literally stemmed from a woman's book club to begin with. Um, and a lot of this is outdated, of course, uh, these thought processes, but a lot of it back then, the man goes to work, a uh, woman stays home. Uh, this, this group of women got together and through their book club, they expanded. Uh, they petitioned and advocated for a public library. And it started from those humble roots where they have their first library building. I believe this building's still around. It's over a hundred years old at this point. And it, it was initiatives like that. But if you go back further, you look in different countries, going back to your Greek philosophers, you've technically had your libraries. You've had these public institutions of public information. And the whole concept was information for all, right? Make them, it's sacred. A library, one term I like to use often is a library is a sanctuary. You come in there where you want to save history, save information. Give that access to everyone. Um, now I mentioned the evolution of libraries to you. Why we say why that had to happen? Google, the uh, dominance of the internet. When that ease of access was now able to be gotten at home, and then from your do you have your, say. your phones, you know, yeah, I have a world of information here, and I think that's a beautiful thing. I love that, but here's the dangerous thing about that too: is people with that easier access. When I'm on there. I go on my Yahoo homepage. It's curating a homepage based on my likes and interests. It's showing me what I want to see, things that tr enable my belief systems as well. Right. And that can be dangerous. That's where you have to go outside of what's being curated for you to find the most factual information you can. Um, so that's where libraries come into play is we're the ones who want to teach people good information-seeking practices. How do you find good, accurate info? Now, if I may say... That is the like, that's the substance of libraries. That's, you know, the professions, but it's not the sexy aspect of, I guess I could say, that's not what's going to bring people in. We know it's an important thing to advocate for and strive for. That's not the most marketable thing. So you had to start offering children's play areas within the library. You have to have more colorful, vibrant settings, activities that go beyond what you would expect from a library. Like I was mentioning yoga programs, you know, yeah. way back when you would never imagine that, um, especially when you're involving animals. The stereotype that most people still think of libraries is, Shh. yeah, no talking. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you have to keep your volume at this level right here. It, it's yeah, you know, we're so far beyond that. Um, so we had to evolve. Libraries had to become more so community centers. If I can ask, why, why was that a culture? The oh, whispering, the, the yeah, whispering the, the shush and the whispering. Because <sighs> I think you, I think you redefined for me what a what a librarian is i appreciate that right yeah like i was going through high school and it was the shush culture like of course. you walk i actually i remember the first library that i like have a memory of was willow springs elementary in liverpool i think mm -hmm. or something like that i might be getting that wrong but I, I i distinctly remember going in being very confused by the dewey decibel system very confused and i'm like why don't you just put this alphabetically 
And then somebody was like, well, it's because of this. And I, I didn't understand that. And then I remember talking to my friend, trying to find a book and the librarian came over and said, you're being too loud. Yep. And I was like, you know what? And I was like, I don't, I don't know where this book is, but I need every class. <laughs> you know, and that's something that I wish I could tell you that there's clear cut answers on that in the studies I've had, right? In right. my experience of that. Um, all I can give you is conjecture here because there's never a, uh, it's never been clearly defined why that culture emerged. emerged. Yeah. I just have to imagine due to how much libraries were primarily associated with academia over the years and then wanting to have a quiet environment for concentration or not, but it was taken to the nth degree, um, to too much of an extreme. Yeah. And uh, even when I was a kid, um, and I don't mean when I was 14 working libraries, but before that, as a visitor of the library, as a young child, you started seeing that evolve a little bit, but even still story times, you know, that's, when you look at long term of the history of library story times a newer innovation, but even still, when they first started, uh, it was still a more quiet, muted environment. It mm -hmm. was literally just a story time. It was the book, reading the book, maybe explaining some literacy tips to explain the science behind early literacy, but it wasn't any of those manipulatives and props we bring out now, where we bring out the colorful parachute and we have the kids going. Oh down. yeah, the bubble machine. The bubble mach they go you know, wild for the I, bubble machine. I love my bubble machine. Yeah. I absolutely adore the bubble machine. And it's the funny thing is that, you know, to people coming in, they just say, oh, this just looks like fun. It's great. But even things like that bubble machine, there's a value behind it. Um, with the youngest of children, for example, you have these safe, harmless material floating around. For a young child working on their eye tracking, it is such a great exercise for them. You know, it's something you might not think of. You're like, oh, they're just bubbles. They're fun. No, there yeah. is a science behind those, too. It's just we're, you know, as more information comes out, we're evolving and we're trying to tie in good science. Uh, good practices in a way that appeal to a larger group of people. That's so. <laughs> deep. I love that look. <laughs> yeah, it's so deep. It, it's like, again, getting to know you. Uh, in, well, I met you at story time with our with that, my kids. That's right. And then, uh, then we, I think we just hit it off, man, because you you were just a really cool dude. Well, kindred spirits, you. I feel a lot. Oh yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, public servants. You've been doing it longer than I have. I haven't been doing it since fourteen. You know, but you, I so appreciate you saying that the public servant, so going back to the sh culture, I think yeah. a lot of it too. Um, and as a, a supervisor, this is something I look for um, when I interview is uh, you did get a lot of people, people in the library profession who are looking out for their best interest. Like sure. it is a job that, you know, you're doing good for the public, but people would still use that as an avenue just for themselves. As like, okay, I want, I want to work in a perceived quiet environment. Hmm. Um, this is what I can get out of this job. But what I like to see, I know I think what you picked up on when you met me, um, is I want to see people who, when they go into this line of work, they're doing it because what can I do for others? Right. Um, that, in my opinion, is what should be your main motivating factor, at least in public libraries, because then you have academic libraries, legal libraries, um, yeah. so many different variations of the profession. But if you're going to be going into a public work and especially focusing on children, they deserve someone who sincerely cares and wants to do well for them just because you want to do well for them. There's no ulterior motive. It's just, you might be the only person in their lives that are doing that too. It, that's the thing. I've worked at some inner city libraries with children um, who have terrible lives that they're trying to escape from and they just need some support. And for them just to see another, oh, there's this adult that has no connection to me, no ties to me, but they just care about me. The impact that can have on someone is huge. Um, I actually, for a while, I worked a program called Boys Club, which was for the young men in the uh, local city I worked for that were at risk. A um, lot of things going on. And it wasn't always focused on um, something academic or whatnot. Sometimes we just brought out, at that time, it was the Nintendo. We played some Mario Kart with the kids. But it was keeping them away from incredibly violent instances. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, there are, I have seen it where I see a news report comes up and a child that I used to work with I see has died at a young age because they were in a shooting. Mm -hmm. um, these are the kind of environments these kids are coming in. And if I can, and if it's just adjacent to it, if it's a butterfly effect where maybe it wasn't me directly, but it was the impact going down. If I can know that I can create a better experience, create better opportunities for somebody. And especially they can avoid that kind of fate. How, you know, how can I not feel fulfilled by that? Right. Yeah. I'll, uh, I went to a leadership course this last week and there's, um, I think, 
I know you're a supervisor now, mm -hmm. but every I think every librarian needs to have this mindset as well that they are a leader to the kids that are there. Yes. Right. There's a lot of philosophies that can be that I pulled away from that course, but uh, a guy named Daryl Rivers put on the course and came out and instructed it. And the one thing that really stuck with me is if you want someone to stop doing something, give them something to do. Yes. And that's so applicable to the youth, especially. So I worked in Durham, North Carolina for a little bit and they had an after school program where police officers would volunteer. We wouldn't get paid for it or anything. And we would help them out with their homework. I don't think Durham's library system was really the best. I think it was really underfunded. There's some history with that city that. And that's common for a lot of libraries yeah. across the country for sure. It's so unfortunate, man. And we, you know, position of privilege living where we do in Colorado. Mm -hmm. There's such an emphasis placed on it, and the community support for it is nuts. Oh, goodness. even 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 with like people without kids, like they recognize, okay, this is the future of our generation. Yes, you know, or future of the county and stuff. But the after school program, the whole premise was, we don't want them to get involved in gang activity. Mm -hmm. Let's reduce gang violence and gang membership by preoccupying their time until their parents are home, because a lot of them were turnkey. Absolutely, or is it called turn latch or something? I think it's turnkey. I think it's turnkey. Right. They would go home, open the door, go inside, and then what would they do? Go immediately outside, play games. Next thing you know, there's some older guy that's saying, hey, do you want to be, you know, you feel protected in, in this area? And next thing you know, they're wrapped up in some gang. And yeah. a lot of times it's it's the slow approach with the gang stuff. So like I said, if you want to, if you want someone to stop doing something, give them something to do. And And unfortunately, Durham got rid of that program as well, the after school, even though we were volunteering our time. It was just a location that they didn't want to rent out anymore. Right. So it's like, it's really, it's really unfortunate when you see a community suffer like that and lose such a valuable resource. Absolutely. And it's people, I think uh, it's a short sight in this too. People. So earlier we were talking about how I consider myself a realist um, mm -hmm. who hopes for positive things, you know, who hopes for the optimistic point of view. Um, with that said, I like, I know, that I have genuine intentions and that's how I like to operate. But at the same time, I know that many more people are looking the way they look at the world. It's with selfish intent and they want to see, okay, how does this benefit me? I don't care about the common good. How does this benefit me? And even those people can benefit when you have programs like this set aside uh, for individuals who might be at risk, mm -hmm. providing them something to do. Uh, just an example, growing up in my hometown, you know, the local hangout place, it was the Taco Bell parking lot. Um, because there wasn't as many libraries or they had limited hours, the rec centers, things like that. Taco Bell parking spot was a place. And of course, those teens, they were quite creating havoc for the employees there, the other businesses nearby. Yep. You want to look at it from a selfish perspective for these businesses. You have a local library, you have a local program where these kids, these teens can go to. They can be part of something a bit more proactive. Those businesses are now benefiting because you no longer have that happening in your area. It's... Even for those who are selfish, they have something to benefit from this, um, which can make it all the more frustrating when I see anybody advocate against libraries. It's yeah. something that baffles me because it might cost you an extra 12 bucks in your taxes a year. Um, but it's just conceptually, you know, yeah. you don't notice that 12 bucks, but once it's been pointed out to certain people, drives them nuts. Skip Starbucks for two days. There's your 12 bucks. Exactly. You know I mean? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's... um. It, it is interesting when uh, you look at, like I said, we're very privileged where we live because I, I do feel like the library system here gets funded pretty well. Yes, very. Um, especially compared to other areas. On that same note, the uh, benefit per dollar is so high. Oh, absolutely. But I don't think the average person knows that. Right. And, you know, it's... The benefit, you know, and the benefits there for them to utilize. If you're not coming and not using it, that's that's one thing. You're not getting any direct benefit. But like you were saying earlier, all of a sudden you're surrounded by you know children um, who've had more opportunity, more education. Yep. You are going to see those benefits long term for sure. Um, and it's you know part of my profession is trying to get more people to have buy-in on that. And again, we live in an area though where fortunately there is quite a decent amount of buy-in for that. There's still some people that could be persuaded. Oh, of course, there's yeah, always there, there will yeah. always be a. I always want more and more and more. Yep. You know, I want more people to come in, um, <laughs> in a very literal sense of showing that benefit. And this is going back to focusing on the material. And that's this is not even considering the services, 
um, the resources that are just within the library itself, you can use while you're there, like the public computers, the public hotspots, things like that. Um, you know, there's libraries out there who uh, they do this thing where when you check out your book, you get a receipt and it'll show you the value of what you saved by going to a library and checking out your books instead, instead of going to it. Barnes and Noble and buying it. Yeah. Um, that's something I would love to see in the library system I work for. I don't know all the things that go behind the scenes to make that work. Um, but that's been a thing that makes it stand out to people. And then like you can get something at the end of the year. Like you saved four thousand dollars by checking out these books instead of purchasing these books, you know. Um, yeah. And I, that's just the material. Again, that's not even mentioning the facility itself, the services, uh, <laughs> the different consultations we can provide for certain things, uh, the tech tutoring we do. Um, seniors, young children who aren't familiar with technology, they can come in, and I think you know this, especially the senior population. They are so prone to being scammed mm -hmm. um, through different measures online. Uh, we've offered classes and programs on how to avoid that happening to you, you know, entirely free. You come to the library, no catch, free lecture, free seminar on this. And we could have so many people avoiding these situations where they're getting that email from a prince from a foreign country who, uh, they inherited, I don't know, how did it go? Yeah. Yeah. Inherited Normal, the, yeah. Like, something yeah, like yeah. that. I, All we I need is your credit card numbers. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That are, it's like, Hey, I'm your third cousin. Yeah, exactly. And I'm, and I'm arrested down in Mexico City. Can you please send me 500 bucks? Man, and those with AI, uh, and I for so many reasons, I AI is just like anything else. It's uh, like a tool. It can be an amazing benefit. Um, you can also hurt yourself with it. You know, we got to be careful with it. But it, with like scams, they can do it now where they have, you know, when you get those phone calls, you pick up, hello, hello, and you just yep. hang up. Usually yep. that's something that was recording your voice. And that's exactly what they say. They pay attention to social media op um, activity and if they see, oh, this, uh, this young guy has just gone out to a different country on a trip. We're going to reach out to the grandparent and like what you just said. Oh, hey, I'm in trouble in this foreign country. And they'll use something that actually sounds like their grandkid. Yeah. Um, and before you know it, a uh, money's being forwarded over to account that they're never going to see again. Yeah. And then from, a, from an investigative standpoint, it's it's so hard to find where those funds go. And most of the time they leave the country and then it's out of our jurisdiction. Yes. So it's like, and the, the FBI is so inundated with these cases. They can't. Oh, I have to imagine the volume too. just from what I witness in a library. And um, when I worked in some of those inner city libraries, I would see people getting catfished a lot. I'm on yeah. online dating websites. Um, you see photos that are clearly fake posed, whatnot. And I would actually ask some customers. I was like, I'm sorry, but I have to interject here. Have you ever had a video chat with this person? Like, have you met this person yet? Have they been requesting any money from you? And usually it's they want those iTunes gift cards yep. and they want the number in the back or something. And um, I have to speak up at that point. I was like, I don't think the person you're interacting with here is real. I was like, I don't want to pry into your business too much, but just I advise you be a bit more careful and yeah. maybe do some intensive follow-up right. here. Uh, See if this girlfriend is actually real. Yes, absolutely. Like, I hate to tell you this, sir, but... You're 67 years old and she looks like she's 23. Yes. And uh, do you think she's real? The disconnect that people can create yeah. for themselves, the narrative they can create, the force themselves yeah. to believe something. It's, I've had similar conversations with, yeah. with uh, you know, and you never, you never want to make them feel bad because it's already, it's already. Oh yeah. You want to preserve their dignity. Yeah. Because it, it sucks when they get scammed out of money. Like nobody, nobody wants to be scammed. No, and, nobody wants to admit they've been scammed or a uh, good word. Nobody wants to be a fool. Right. Nobody wants to be fooled. Nobody wants to be a fool. Absolutely. So, um, yeah. So going back to the yep. history of everything, that was in America, largely Greek, things like that. The burning of the Alexandria oh. Library. <laughs> I got I to gotta inquire because it, it, that fascinates me so much because there was so much history. And that's, you know, that's, um, that is what drives so many people nuts. Uh, and it doesn't have to just be people in the profession. Anyone yeah. who values good information, will not. how much progress has been hindered yeah. because of what we lost there? You know, that is the, one of the most upsetting things. And then modern times, it is so easy to archive information to be able to, I don't know, trying to think here of what I want to say of when information started being digitized largely, because even though um, the mainstream public didn't have access to the internet and computers um, at a certain point. Um, oh, it was probably uh, 1960s is when the first computers really started making their debut. 1950s. And, and did that start with military application? Yeah, military application. Then Purdue, I think, was the first 
uh, university that have a computer. So let's go from there back then. Um, the, the archiving process for making you know, mostly physical print items here, right? right? This is how you pass on information. Um, you go so far back in human history, it was literally tales around the fire uh, to overly simplify. It was yep. literally generational stories being told from one to another to another. And then, of course, we had a written text, written document, uh, documentation. So, yes, the burning of that library, it's um, that that's information we can't ever get back. And it it's disquieting when you hear. And that concept is what we fear when you hear about people wanting to remove content from libraries, remove content from public libraries. Um, it's basically the same principle you're wanting to restrict information and the access of it to others. At least in this case, the information can still exist out there in some way, but mm -hmm. to literally burn this material and lose it to history, that is such a shame. Um, my personal belief is whether you agree information, disagree or disagree with information, it should be preserved. Because um, if there's something that you don't like out there, wouldn't you want to know about it as much of it as possible? So you can be yeah, for it? Yeah, if you, uh, I was in a debate club and one of the, the best ways to prepare for a debate was to learn the other side yes. through and through. Because if you're going to make logical arguments against something, and rightfully so in a lot of situations, but then the other side's doing the same stuff with your material. Mm -hmm. And it's this, uh, I, I feel like the art of debate has been lost in, in our modern times. Everyone says, uh, in my experience, the labeling negates the debate. Yes, I would say so. And that's... Uh... I find it appropriate to say that because I actually get caught up so much on, uh, I feel people um, rely on terminology too much. Yeah. Um, and I think when you do that, it oversimplifies um, the layers of an issue, a person, a, a, any subject matter. Um, I have to agree with the art of the debate being lost. It's, uh, it's why I so often now... Um, I don't feel the motivation to get into a good debate with someone anymore because it's not a matter of a discussion which involves speaking and listening. The listening aspect, yes. I feel, has been removed for most people. I shouldn't say most people because that's another common thing is you hear about all these extreme cases, whether it's, let's say, politics, for example. It's the loudest voices you hear the most. Mm -hmm. um, and then what a lot of people don't realize is that you have this extreme, you have this extreme. A lot of people are still fitting closer to a center and maybe slightly skewed one way or another. Um, I just wish those people were more prominent and you had more of those active listeners. Um, conversation I had with a, uh, actually another library professional who I haven't talked with in a few years. Um, I can't remember the exact subject matter, but we were talking on a subject that I changed my mind on um, since he originally knew me years ago. He's like, what? I thought you were always set on this. So I was like, I changed my mind. Good yeah. information was presented to me. Uh, the evidence was there and it was enough for me to realize, oh, my perspective on that was wrong. Right. And and that's the, I, I feel like another fault of our society is too many people find themselves married to their ideals and ideas. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be married to them. If no. I say, if I say or think something one day, that doesn't mark me for the rest of my life. No. I could be presented, like you said, with the information from a, from a contrary perspective of mine and then change my view. Right. Christopher Hitchens. I, I love, uh, so I, as if, if there's listeners that are listening in from other podcasts, they know that I'm, I'm really big in theology. So I really wanted to, uh, Christopher Hitchens wrote a book that, uh, titled God, God is not great. And it's, uh, directly contrary like Islamic ideology. So I'm, or, um, Al Akbar, which is God mm -hmm. is great. Yes. Uh, so he, he's, he's labeled as a contrarian. But every – he died, I think, 2012 or something like that. Every debate he was in, the amount of intently listening to the other side was astonishing. And there's, there's, there are some things that he was like wholeheartedly fast on. Like his, his atheism ideologies were one of those things where he's like, no, this is – definitively people are always going to have their things that are set in stone exactly but right. there are other things that he would listen to the debate he was malleable on yeah well he'd listen to the debate and say you know i understand where you're i understand at minimum that is that is such a gesture that people overlook these days is like hey we don't have to agree i understand where you're coming from and that right 
that phrasing, that simple, those two words, I understand, that opens the door to so much more yep. conversation. And it could be the first step to eliminating so much ignorance, mm -hmm. you know, and a willful ignorance that I think right. more people are entrenching themselves in. Yep. Um, and I myself, I am sure that I have been susceptible to that my, as well, you know. Um, I always like to evolve. I'm always trying to progress. But I have to imagine there are mm -hmm. certain things, you bring up the right subject, that I'll be a bit more stubborn than, than other subjects. Yep. But I always try and move past yeah. that. Um, it's an active process of self-improvement. Well, it's also uh, what information have you been exposed to? Right. So going back to the removing of certain content from a public library, yeah. I completely agree with you. If, if you don't like it, that's fine. I would encourage you to read it. Like Learn about this thing that... Yeah. Because if I may interject real quick, I love you saying that because it is... Uh, one of the most frustrating, you know, if you, if you can prove to me and you show me that you legitimately have looked into this content, you've looked into everything and you still don't like it, I can at least respect that you put in the time, yep. you got to know it. Um, what drives me nuts is how many people are acting on hearsay. Yes. Something just heard. They heard a tidbit. Um, and well, I read the title of this news article and it said this. And I'm like, did you at least read the two page article yes. after the title? Well, no, I didn't have time for that. I'm like, all right. You have no ground to stand on, I right. feel, at that yeah. point. Um, so, yeah, I would just thank you for saying that. You know, I I appreciate mentioning that is people just, they want to speak up on something they don't even know about. So you saying, did, did you read the book? Did yeah. you read the article? Yep. That should always be the first step. Well, and that's that's like the big thing whenever I talk to people about ideology and faith stuff. I'm like, did you read everything? Because I, 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 I'm, granted, I'm no, like, amazing scholar. But uh, I talk to friends mostly on Sundays. And I'm like, well, did you read the Torah? And they're like, well, no, I read the Old Testament. And I was like, but did you read the Torah? Because there's a difference in the Torah versus the Old Testament. And even though the Old Testament is the Torah, there's things missing from it. Of course. And, I, and it's like, I, I understand. I, I, that's the main thing I tell them. I'm like, I understand where, you, where you're thinking. I just want you to have all the information before we start, because it normally is a debate and it, it's healthy debates. It's not like Excellent. I get shouted out or anything, but I always predicate it on, do you have all the info that I have? Right. And that's another thing in the art of debate, you hand over each other's scholar, scholarly journals. So if you're going to debate something, you say, hey, based on this study, this scholarly journal, X, Y, and Z, that's why I hold my ground. Prior to the debate, you hand it over and the other side gets to read your article and find holes in it. Yes. So it's like the, the, I can sit here and argue with somebody that's completely ignorant of everything, right? I'm wasting my time. Absolutely. I need to give them the same information I have and let them come to a healthy conclusion. Yes. And the thing is you're using good sources to cite. I, this is me yeah. uh, showing my profession again here, but you're saying scholarly, uh, you know, scholarly journal showing that peer reviewed work. Yep. Uh, you're not saying it was a uh, post you got off of social media. Yeah. Um, there's actually been so many interesting experiences that people put out there where they put a uh, interesting headline and a certain thumbnail as the image for a social media post. And they would see on that base level how many people would comment and the opinions they would derive from that. But if you actually click through, just click the link that it's showing you and, and not just the headline. I've seen tests and experiments where the content within it was a completely uh, the opposite of what the headline had. But people were making assumptions and strong beliefs and then passing this on to others based on the headline when if you actually just opened it, it was entirely different information. Um, I should make – I'm going to take this as a short and try that experiment. I think you I got to come up with a title though. Yeah, find something that you know can rile people up and then have a completely different message within the link. Yeah. See how many people, you know, and make sure it's – try and find an open platform so it's not just friends and family. Yeah. Like yeah, you yeah. want to get as wide of a population size as possible. Yeah. Um, it's Which, fascinating to see the results at times. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. I do. I, I think back to the library of Alexandria, mostly from the, uh, a lot of people forget this, the Rosetta stone ah. wasn't trans, like wasn't translated until like 2000. It, uh, yeah, absolutely. It took 2000 years to finally figure out what these Egyptians were writing. Mm -hmm. And if we just had that library. Imagine all the things because like even the translation of the Rosetta Stone is a little iffy and up for debate. Um, but think of like all the information we could have had. Like you, I'm sure you've seen it. The hier hier hieroglyph of the like helicopter looking thing. Mm -hmm. Bro, what if they had helicopters? Oh yeah. And that, 
My goodness, the amount of, <laughs> like how many? So we talk, you know, about our different technological uh, revolutions we've gone through. How many could have happened earlier? Right. And okay, we mentioned AI earlier. Like we've seen how when people uh, like to hate up, hate on humanity, and become very jaded and bitter. And I can understand where a lot of it's coming from. I like to remind people just how much humans have accomplished. Like we were one of the most fascinating creatures on this planet. Like what we've done is phenomenal. Um, so you'll think about how quick and exponential our evolution have been with technology. Um, like if you were to, oh, I can't recall the, if you were to look at from when the Wright brothers got their plane off the ground. And then when we got to the moon, the relatively speaking, the time that passed between those two landmark achievements in human history, not that far away from each other. Yeah. I think it was like, speaking. I think it was like 40, 50 years. So you take all that text and this is just, you know, you're thinking one of the most famous book burning, uh, you know, events and the, yeah, that's been happening for been, us. Yeah. It's happened during uh, military occupations. Yep. Um, going to other countries, removing their information, dest- destroying their texts. When ISIS went into, uh, I think it was Iraq. Uh, yeah, I think Iraq, the amount of damage they did to history, they're just blowing things up solely just to get rid of the history of it. Absolutely. And we lose, as we're saying, the amount that is lost from that and the amount of good that could have come from having the information. You mentioning the helicopter hieroglyph there, the, yeah. the glyphs on there. What if we could have made that progress earlier? Where would we be now? If we were starting some of this progress even earlier. Yeah. And it's, I had a buddy tell me, uh, because we went down this thought process and he's like, yeah, everyone's expecting a little like Martian to come out of a UFO, but like, what if they're just humans from the ancient past that got off this planet? Something bad happened here. Uh, I I tend to believe the younger Dryas impact theory that Graham Hancock kind of pushes, um, which caused this massive flood. But like, what if they got off this planet and with their technology, they came back and they're like, uh, let's see if they can recover, but we're not going to interject. Oh yeah. And, and then a- like, lo and behold, you know, fast forward the clock. We're in 2024 now. Fast forward the clock a couple more years. They make their debut. They come out of the little UFO. And it's not a little green Martian. It's just another human. Yeah, something that looks just like you. I think that's going to cause a lot of people's brains to be fried. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you speaking on theology previously, imagine the impact that would have there. Oh, my because God. Yeah. The impact, it goes so much further. I've always said that uh, if I thought of the same thing, only I imagine a scenario where we somehow, I mean, at this point, we would, we would have to have faster than light travel to be able to find a another planet that's in that Goldilocks zone. Yeah. Um, I think the closest one is, well, the closest ec- like solar system, I think is 4.7 yeah. it, but, light it, years away or something like that. But So say we go somewhere that far out and yeah. you discover an alien species and it looks just like us. Like the implications of that are huge. And then, uh, oh, what is the, uh, the three grades of civilization that they say that uh, a species want to try and make it pass in? Um, the theory is that we're either we've I think we moved past one, and they don't know if we're on the other side of two or not, and that themes on if a species of a planet really and its uh, inhabitants can survive past a certain point, basically the death of your own star. Yeah, well, the death of our own star, and uh, it's like planetary control. Yes. Can we control volcanoes? Can we control hurricanes? Can we control solar flares? Uh, I think it's yeah. I think it's a type three. Because type one is the highest, isn't it? I can't remember which type direction it goes. I know the Dyson sphere concept is that one of them. Yeah. Where you're using, I think it's, what is it? You're using your sun, s- your sun's yeah. energy um, for the sake of a, a renewable energy that you can constantly use and yep. for interstellar travel, I believe. Yeah. Um, I know a while back that they saw something out way off in the cosmos that looked like a ring. Oh, yeah. And they're like, is this that? And I'm pretty sure they came to, well, it would have, if they came to the conclusion it was that, obviously, uh, it would be all over the news and whatnot. So, clearly, they came to the conclusion of something else. You know, I, I well, there was that. There was also, more recently, there was that planet that was found with uh, with uh, lights, like city city lights Ooh. that NASA found. I wasn't and aware of that. That sounds yeah, fascinating. I'll, I'll shoot you the article. Yeah, NASA released it, and they're like, you know, it just, the problem is, is the way light travels, that, that civilization could be long dead. Well, yeah, that... That was one of the things that blew me my blew my mind as a kid. For my uh, physical science teacher was, you know, when you're looking at the stars, 
that light you're saying, you're kind of looking back in time here because of how long that light from those very distant stars has taken to get to you. Yeah. You know, that's So amazing. if an alien's looking at Earth, they're probably seeing dinosaurs still. Yeah, you know, and that's... Unless they're here. Right. Looking like us, like you said. Like us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's trippy. Yeah, so I, I do, you know, the burning the burning of information is is kind of alarming. I will ask you, we... If you if you're a nihilist, you look at the you know things that are going on in the world in that perspective, and you say uh, we're going towards something, and it's not good. Mm -hmm. uh, might it be a world war uh, where there's going to be catastrophic casualties? So not not there's there's knowledge that you walk around with from an experiential standpoint, but there's also information you're walking around with that you haven't yet disclosed. Like you 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 haven't even come to fruition of the knowledge that you you hold. The potential right mm -hmm. so if we'll say 400 million people off this earth immediately because of some global war um the amount of knowledge and experience you're losing from that is significant what i'll ask is from a standpoint of like emp nuclear blast things like that frying computer systems what's the backup like i know we have a doomsday bunker with a bunch of seeds yeah, yeah, you're aware of that. There are systems in place with texts where a lot of this information is transcribed to text, but it can't account for everything. It's yeah. legitimately impossible. The infrastructure of the internet and having you know a global information source that's shared across billions of people, um, that amount of information cannot be accounted for. Um, so if we're looking at a case of a legitimate global EMP, let, let's say one of those solar flares did that to us, oh, completely you know? wipes out the entire planet. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. There would be a huge damage to that. And funny enough, there's video games that touch on the concept to certain extents. It wasn't a solar flare, but actually, um, there was a video game that came out called horizon zero dawn. Oh yeah. Um, with the, uh, robots. Yes. Yes. The big robot dinosaurs and yeah. whatnot. And, um, it's funny enough, people are already theorizing, like, okay, so everyone's dressed up like tribal. They're using ancient weaponry and everything. But then there's these high-tech robot machines. So people weren't sure the timeline of the game. It turns out it is a post-apocalyptic situation. And uh, what actually happened is, as humanity was progressing, uh, this evil corporation and whatnot, they made the decision. It's like, you know what? We're hitting the uh, kill switch. And billions of people dying. Uh, only small tribes of people surviving and having to regrow. And all that information buried, destroyed, gone. Um, funny enough, too, by the way, that game actually takes place in, uh, turns out it takes place in Colorado. In oh, April. really? Yes, because as you go through the game, you begin finding these uh, items that let you see flashbacks uh, of the past. And at one point, you discover what is clearly Red Rocks. And um, huh. it's uh, you're hearing a conversation between two people enjoying the concert. Um, and you can just look at it. like. And then when you realize the game is in Colorado, and you look around more and see the structure like oh yeah how did i not notice this before this is absolutely called i gotta play it again now oh yeah yeah i played it one time through it's a good game so you remember though and then they um there's the big conflict at the end there where um they discover some of this information that's been preserved and it's like do we <coughs> save it do we preserve it do we bring this back but what if we do and it leads to us destroying each other again yeah you know they yeah. realize all the conflict that that existed in our society prior to right so there are some backup options, you know, and it basically comes down to transcribing the physical text, yeah. uh, preserving. Um, they might have, there might see be some kind of form of digital backup that exists as well uh, for that could withstand something like the MP, but I'm imagining sure. a hypothetical scenario where there's nothing digital that can withstand that. Um, yeah. I mean, there's uh, just from my time in the military, like Amazon warehouse services does a lot of uh, contingency plans. So, like, unless the facility, which is a remote location and not disclosed to people, mm -hmm. gets directly blasted, it's okay. It can withstand – like, it won't communicate outward. Right. But it will communicate inward. So – but it would be interesting. Like, could you imagine, you know, walking around and, like, finding the server room and it's still in operation? And you're like, what the heck is all this? Oh, trying to comprehend what it is as well? Oh, yeah. The information that's there? Well, it's like the ancient astronaut theory. Like – uh so there's, are you, are you savvy with all like the UFO stuff going on? Oh goodness. Yeah. I mean, okay. again, librarian, the very first section in the Dewey Decimal is the zero, zero, zeros, cryptozoology, UFOs, paranormal, um, 
all of that's literally the very first section of the Dewey Decimal System. I wish I knew this. <laughs> yeah, so I'm very... Uh, 30 minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. We would have just talked about this the entire time. Oh, goodness. It's a uh, subject <laughs> but, that I'm well-versed in. So there's, uh, there's a lot crashed objects or and like the thought process possibly donated items um has been happening forever so there's a lot that you know ancient humans might have had mm -hmm. like this this thing and they've worshipped it and everything else like that and they built things around it or they they figured out uh how to use it slightly it's kind of like um the thought process if we took a motorcycle back we'll say 2000 years ago Mm -hmm. uh, and we bring it to, uh, was it Julius Caesar that was the Roman Empire emperor at that time? Something like that. And we bring it to the Romans and we say, you know, here's your motorcycle. The keys are in it. It's not turned on though. We just leave it there. Mm -hmm. They're going to see that and be like, so, uh, we know what those wheels are. Yeah, there's going to be some basic things. There's going to be basic things. They're going to they're be like, this looks like a seat. Let's sit something on Something with a combustion engine. Right. Try well, and then, that. yeah, so they'll, they'll probably be like, okay, well, let's push it up this hill. And then like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, if I, if I, if I hold this, it, it moves, but if I let go, it stops, you know? And then eventually they'll figure out how to turn it. Like with tinkering with it, yeah. they don't rip it apart. If they tinker with it for a little bit, they're going to turn it on. Yeah. And they're going to realize like, oh, okay, this is how we, you know, use it and all this other stuff. So the thought process is with the, with the. Uh, UAPs, UFOs, is that they've always been donated or like crashed or whatever yeah. uh, on this earth. And in modern era, we, the United States, um, this is just prior to uh, the, the Nazi bell that crashed in Italy was 37, I think, 1937. Okay. So before Roswell. Roswell? Yeah, yeah, Roswell, New Mexico. Yep. So before that, uh, happened that was a big point of the united states military operation in germany that's not really ever talked about this object from space crashed in italy the the third reich get got it and they're like oh this is gonna we're gonna win the war from this yeah. and they were tinkering with it right so the united states military was like we need that we don't know what it is we need it so like but this 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 history of collecting artifacts so either digging them up from earth and finding them buried, you know how wild that would be? Like we're just digging in a cave or we're like bebopping in the cave one day, mining for gold and we chip away a wall and poof, it falls. And there's like this cavity with this UFO just sitting there. Well, something that defies all your understanding of, you know, physics, uh, technology that exists on our planet. It's, uh, it, it would absolutely be mind blowing. And it drives me uh, crazy how many people disregard these stories. A lot of time, you mentioned, you know, uh, with the Nazis there yep. uh, and then with the military, we have so many, uh, so people have come out, uh, legitimate, credible people, uh, great military history, mm -hmm. uh, people that you can reach out to their entire community and they have nothing to tell you. Oh, it's an honest person, great person, integrity, yep. who have had these stories where they witness these uh, aircrafts. We have recordings of pilots yeah. witnessing aircraft that, to their knowledge and the human understanding, is not operating in a way that makes any sense to them. Um, and yet these stories are brushed to the side. And there's so many of them. You, how long ago was it that the Pentagon declassified? Uh, All those documents? Yeah. No, dude, that was, well, that was within the last two years. And you know what gets me is like, I was deeply moved by a lot of that stuff. Like individually, I was deeply moved. Like I always thought there were aliens, like the, the, the probability of there being an alien civilization is huge. An intelligent well, one. The scope of the universe. I exactly. Mean, that's all you have to do. Yeah. So the intelligent aspect of a of a civilization, I'm like, okay, I can kind of understand. We might be very few. Like there might there might not be a lot of them. I can buy that. But at the same time, I always had this inclination, like, yeah, there probably is something. And then to have the government come out and say, yeah, uh, we have these crafts that are not of human origin, mm -hmm. and then everybody just kind of skated over it. Well, because people start. They fill in the blanks with the answer that makes them more comfortable that they can accept with because the unknown for a lot of people is terrifying. So they'll think, oh, they say not of human origin, but they really mean it's just an origin we don't understand. It's probably a foreign government, a former military. That's yeah, but working they, they the specifically center. said non-human origin. And, uh, absolutely. Which blows my mind. And it's that willful ignorance again. It's people just choose not to – they'll hear it, but they don't receive it. Yeah. You know? 
Uh, yes, anyone who's just looking at it, the way it's presented, why is this not blowing more people's minds? Like, yeah. why isn't this rewiring the way some people think? Because, again, the implications of something like that, massive. Yeah, and even the Catholic massive. Church has come out and stated more recently, yeah, there's, there's extraterrestrial life. Oh, yeah. So, like, some of the people, mind you, the Catholic Church, Galileo, hey, the Earth is round. We're not ethnocentric. We're actually heliocentric. We're going around the sun. Galileo, he was killed, like imprisoned. And then they're like, hey, you're going you gonna to walk back on your statements? And he's like, no. They killed him. Yeah. So that, that, that body, you know, 400 years later, well, a couple, a couple of years, uh, I think it was like 100 years later, they finally acknowledged like, okay, yeah, we're not the center of the universe. But you fast forward the clocks. Now we're saying, oh, yeah, there's extraterrestrial life. Thankfully, people aren't being killed. Oh, to my thank knowledge. God. Well, it's no <laughs> saying what could have happened. Yeah, right? right. Exactly. So, oh man, it's it's just that that type of stuff like always boggles me. But back to the servers, like even if they find these the server room, well, how do you make the content accessible? Well, yeah, like if I if I'm looking at this as an ancient human, and this so for listeners or yeah, the listeners that are tuning in, I'm looking at my computer and I'm seeing myself and I'm seeing Brandon. I would think this is some sort of portal. Well, and this is, yeah, it, I was thinking this when you were mentioning the motorcycle story, uh, bringing the motorcycle back for like the Roman Empire. At least it is a physical object that exists within a, it doesn't defy any of the logic that they're aware of. You know, it's got wheels. The combustion would be something to wrap their head around for sure. Yeah. But, you know, it's something I think that they can get there well. This, your laptop, sh- you just show them a recording of themselves. You know, pull that up on your phone. Pull that little square. Show them uh, – what's an example? Show them a one of the uh, Michael Bay Transformer films. Get a flamethrower. You know? Oh, goodness. Absolutely. You're and a he, wizard. It, I can see why they, res, you yeah. know, think that's the magic. Uh, a lot of people I know are going to be going to Texas soon for the eclipse event happening. Yeah. I completely understand why when that happened for ancient civilizations, they saw that. They thought, oh, have I been praying to the wrong thing? Should I pray to whatever's causing this? You know, like literally, yeah. your your source of life just got blocked out, and you have no com- you have no way of comprehending why that's happening, what's happening, and the shadows look freaky. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like every time there's an eclipse, the shadows do this like try, or like uh, it's almost like looking through. What are those called when you look through them and it's got all like the different kaleidoscope? Sh- kaleidoscope. Yeah, yeah. All the shadows are acting funky. But um, what I was also going to say is my theory on Merlin, the wizard, mm-hmm. is that he's possibly just a time traveler. Time just traveler, fun, yeah. Which I've heard, went, which just went back with like a bunch of cool technology. See, I've always heard a scientist who uh, was the, was making those technological breakthroughs, sure. yeah, um, before anyone else and keeping it to themselves, and they were using their knowledge to make it seem as magic. So it's kind of adjacent to the time yeah. travel theory. Well, could I you imagine well. like having a Tesla tower oh and building a Tesla tower <laughs> in your wizard's tower? Yeah, absolutely. and someone comes in, and you're like you're holding a metal metal you know stick, and you hold it up just right, and a arc of lightning hits it. Oh yeah. And then you're like, come in if you dare. Uh, I would I would be like, nope. That guy is tapped into some sort of magic. You could do the same thing with something as simple as a lighter. Oh yeah. Fire. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know? Yeah. And then you have high high contact alcohol. Drink it and poof. Oh yeah. That, that's a, something I've talked about before too. Uh we're talking information, uh Talk about people having less access to information, information not being widely available. I wonder how many um, lore and stories that have come from human history have been due to people eating local fungi and hallucinogens. Oh, yeah. And not realizing, oh, this thing I'm eating is going to make me uh, experience ego death and the world's going to completely change on me because of this uh, mushroom I ate here. Yeah. You know, how, how many people were that happening to before they decided, oh, wait, when you eat this, this happens? Yeah. So how many people were just naturally consuming things like that. And then what they experienced afterwards, they were passing off as reality, you know? But then meanwhile, (laughs) we have things again with like hard evidence, these UFO sightings, these reports, credible reports that gets disregarded though. Yeah. Hey, I tripped and talked to God, trust me. And they're like, okay, yeah, whatever you say. And then you're like, Hey, you see that thing up in the sky right there? Yeah. How's it doing that? Oh my God. It just shot off in the blink of an eye. Okay, nothing happened here. We're okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That one is the more unbelievable one, though. Yeah, it's bonkers. I think it, it's I think bonkers. it's great to look into any subject, though, because you know the uh, what I fear too is the uh, 
let's say the talk from the God stories. Mm-hmm. Sure, 99 people could be lying, but I want to look into every one because there might be that one that there's something to. Oh, yeah, you know? absolutely. And it, I'm not saying you, can, you shouldn't, you should not buy into every story, but do your due diligence. Yeah, I think there's you know? something interesting nowadays um, because the burning bush was, uh, I forgot what exactly it was. Um, but the burning bush Moses saw I'm typing it in now. I think Google is going to fix it. Oh God. I can't pronounce that. Uh, Dictanimus. I see the word. This plant. I have no chance of pronouncing that either, but, uh, there's a thought process behind that, that it contained DMT. Oh yeah. And that's Which one of the most the powerful. I mean, that'll hallucinogenics. Uh... And it's, what's interesting with DMT is that it, it goes off when you're dying. Yes, it doesn't it also play a role in dreaming as well. I thought to an extent. Yeah. So but, it's it's all so I I'm so fascinated with the study. There, uh, thank God, um, Sanford in uh, the UK is is studying DMT mm-hmm. like finally because there's so much one that I think from a therapeutic standpoint it can explain, but the, it it's just like studying dopamine. Yeah. Like it's so present in your brain. Your brain creates this hallucinogenic drug in your own brain. Every night you go to bed, you get a little sprinkling of it. And then when you die, so a lot of people, if you watch uh, Nature is Metal mm-hmm. on Instagram, a lot of times you'll see like the antelopes just sitting there while they're being chewed, like from their from their legs and the lions are eating them while they're actively alive. A lot of that is because the brains are releasing this chemical that are causing them to trip out. Well, it's a preservation method, you know? Yeah. You can't, you can't handle what's happening to you and yep. this is your way to make it more bearable. Mm-hmm. And what gets me is like, there's there there might be some correlation between this reality that we're in and the next reality. Because again, we were talking. I would think I think my, maybe it was recorded, but we were chatting before this, talking about how time's just per- perceived. It's oh not- yeah, it's yeah. We perceive it as linear, but that's very far from the truth. Right. Uh, the quote Doctor Who. Funny enough, I think they got it. Uh, very silly way to say it, but it's wibbly wobbly. Um, time it's it's hard for us to wrap our head around the true way that it's actually the way it exists the way it functions yeah so the thing about it is if you're if you are actively dying your body is passing on either by old age trauma or whatever it is there's some time that's passing Mm -hmm. and in that time that's passing for you time might slow down so a lot of people like when they have near-death experiences they, they say, yeah, my, my audio went away, and then I really couldn't see, and then I saw this bright light. But as that was happening, time felt so distorted. I felt like I was gone for years. Yeah, absolutely. I was I, like that bright light and this 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 wholeness and this, this love and embrace. And I look back and I see my body, and like they experience something, mm-hmm. and that process can be correlated to DMT. And I say that because they're doing studies now in Sanford where they're slow dripping people like IV style DMT so they can prolong the experience that they're having. What they're not realizing is that time distortion is real. So they're exposing people to like an hour long drip of DMT. If people just, uh, you can smoke it or you can lick frogs. Yeah. Uh-huh. DMT. Don't lick frogs. Leave the frogs alone. It's good, uh, good advisory there. Yeah. Don't bother frogs. Or I think they're a toad, but just don't lick frogs and don't lick toads. <laughs> um, you know, that trip is only, I think, 10, 15 minutes because it's, it's so fastly metabolized by your brain because mm-hmm. your brain's like, why do I have this right now? I need to get rid of this. It's like cortisol. If your brain has too much of it, it's like, why do I have so much of yeah, this? Yeah, it wants to filter it out. Yeah. Like, okay, it's done its purpose. Adrenaline. Okay, I'm I'm alive. Everything's good. I need to process this out. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, your brain brain does a really good job of getting rid of it. But now we're now we're prolonging people people's exposure to it, and like people are coming out of these trials, like, how long have I been gone? Yeah, and we're like, oh, it's only been an hour. And they're like, I felt like I was gone for a hundred years. <laughs> I lived an entire <laughs> life outside of this reality. So I, I think it's I think it's interesting uh, the correlations between faith and like a lot of the things that are. Like there's uh there's another book that I read. It's called um the sacred uh the cross and the sacred mushroom or something like that. Hmm. And it talks about how uh this one guy 
decoded the Dead Sea Scrolls and then determined like, mm -hmm. hey, they're just talking about mushrooms. Go figure. Interesting. Yeah, he's talking about basically like ancient people, right? Mush Because mushrooms grow after it rains. So like if you're walking around in like Syria or something like that, it's mostly a desert, but then the rain comes and then these this fungus grows. And often uh, often found in like uh, like cow farms too, right? Isn't like oh, a fecal yeah. matter? Cow yeah, well that's. I won't tell people how to make magic mushrooms. No, please. <laughs> but if you took cow manure and you threw it at a tree, uh, it's it's the exposure to the to the the air. Right. 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 But yeah, some of the thought process of our intelligence is based on you know ancient hominids picking up dung and eating mushrooms and tripping off of mushrooms mm -hmm. that opened up their mind. But no, the thought process was, is that they didn't understand rain. Mm. And uh, when it rained, they thought it was, you know, when, when a male and a female have sex and reproduce, you know, the fluid from a man creates something. Right. So they thought the rain from the sky was God ejaculating on the earth and creating these mushrooms, like his flesh coming from the ground and when you ate the mushroom um it, it caused this hallucinogenic experience where you'd be closer to god see this is kind of similar to what i was saying before where people take something that they do have an understanding of and apply it to a different phenomenon yep. to try and grasp it that's what this sounds like to me yeah it is and 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 it's one of those things again if we had the library of alexandria we would probably already have the dead well the dead sea scrolls wouldn't be the dead sea scrolls right we would just have the scrolls mm -hmm. we wouldn't have to piece it together based on animal hide we would just be able to <laughs> go back and be like, oh, yeah, look at this, the original scripture. You know, it's it's interesting concept. I appreciate the work that uh, librarians do, not only locally, but at large. Oh, at a large that. scale, too. Absolutely. Um, we talk about previously that they mentioned the EMP situation there, too. You know, there are librarians in fields, departments that I'm not aware of. That I have to imagine there is more thorough backup options being created. Um, me working in my little public library environment, you know what I've been doing for most of my life. Uh, you know, I'm well aware that this kind of profession, it's it is valued, and there are people out there. I am positive that are putting forth efforts to preserve that information, uh, put it together. And you mentioned on the large scale, like that's some of the on a from an aspect of humanity as a species that are doing some of the most important work um, with the preservation. You know, I want to make sure that your children um, are learning the uh, value of reading, enjoying a lifelong love of learning. Um, there's people out there that want to make sure that we literally are preserving everything we have so humanity can cont can continue to better themselves and learn from their mistakes and progress. Um, it's such a wide spanning field. Yeah. Well, I think it's like the Great Pyramids, right? I still can't get over how much they were able to figure out about the sky, the night sky, the cosmos. Oh, the alignment's amazing. The fact that they it's built just... such a large structure is even more amazing. Oh, yeah. You know, and that's been how many people have discussed that, right? It's abs yeah. it's phenomenal. It's absolutely phenomenal. I struggle making an IKEA shelf, uh, bookshelf. Yeah, I know. And uh, you're telling me these people did this? Like, Well, it, it goes back to the preservation of the information. Mm -hmm. We know, we know from history, information has been lost. And like you stated, if we had that information, where would we be today? Right. So if we can preserve the information today to make sure we don't go back past this. Or even yeah, slow down our progress. That. I don't yeah. want it to be slowed down. Right. Um, again, it might not to be so dire, but not to go back to the dying star again. But for us as a people, and that's just talking about outside interference. We're not even talking about us uh, conflicting with each other. There is a ticking clock constantly. Mm-hmm. We need every bit of advantage we can to progress. Um, we need every bit of information to be able to be shared and exchange, honest information. Um, I still wish if we, we took earlier, um, before the recording, we were talking about the divide between people in general. Mm -hmm. um, if you could remove that divide, I wonder how, many, how much information currently exists that's not being exchanged and shared amongst each other, uh, where we could all benefit from. Yeah. Like, I, I, that keeps me up at night. Well, and it also gets me into another point I want to make is or inquire about. So when you go to the uni, university, um, you get access to scholarly libraries. Oh, yeah. You get all the research databases usually. Um, why? A wide set of them. Why is that? Okay, so two things. Why is that not public knowledge, one? And then two, why is it that the government is – actively chasing after someone who made it public 
Oh, like with uh, Wikipedia, for example? Uh, I can't say the website because mm-hmm. I, I think it's still like blacklisted. Ah, gotcha. You need a VPN to get there. Ah, I see. But they they stole, they said they stole intellectual properties because they're scholarly journals and, mm-hmm. you know, the university owned them and you didn't have access to it. They stole all those archives and posted it on a public server. And they're, I think it was a female, I forgot her name, but she's actively being hunted and looked for, for that crime. So the crime of sharing information, I get the the logic behind it, but I want I want your take on it. Why is it that uh, it's not public, and why is it that universities um, are so willing to prosecute people who make it public? So this, and again, this is going to be my theories for right. it. Um, first, so the first question: Why is it not public? A lot of the, a lot generally speaking, a lot of this information is public and technically it can be public knowledge it's a lack of want from people that want to go in there i think a lot of people now do like being spoon-fed information they don't want to put in the work to go look for deeper information because yes there is a lot locked behind universities but there is also a lot there that's still open access um completely open access content there are areas you can go to uh, as we were mentioning we we're talking about universities um we're talking about the public library here you can go to any of the public libraries that in my career, every public library I've ever worked for, um, you could go in, use a computer there. No need, you don't even have to sign up for the library card. You get a little guest pass. You go on by accessing that library, that computer within the library, you're getting access to all their research databases that are connected to these university databases. Okay. And now you're getting this scholarly information, no cost whatsoever. It's completely public, it's free. Again, though, that's not one of the things that libraries market the most. Um, it's people, it just doesn't draw them in. So the information, it can, it is out there. Now, to your second question, though, there absolutely are universities uh, and other institutions, information institutions in general, that are uh, harboring this information and they, they want it to be locked behind a paywall. Um, they have restrictions. You have to be part of a specific group to have access to it. Freemasons. Uh, my only, theory, just... <laughs> you know, my only theory can be though is that there's either incriminating information, um, and with universities, I, I see this more from like government institutions. Uh, do they incriminate information about certain leaders and whatnot that they don't want being shared? Yeah, the assassination of Kennedy. Uh, you know, all, all the like. Right. Why do you? Why do you keep? prolonging the release of the release of that content you know yeah so it's i my theories are either it's incriminating information and then the more boring answer but probably likely for a lot of institutions greed money um they don't want this to be accessible for free they Mm -hmm. want to get another dollar out of you and if they can lock it behind a paywall um and make money off it why wouldn't they um again as somebody like myself i think that's a massive error information being freely exchanged i think people can only benefit from it can cause conflict um but i'd rather live with an inconvenient truth than a convenient ignorance um and it is i just really want to emphasize again that it's incredibly upsetting though to see how many people just don't care to find this information to verify information um i think there has to be a bigger want for it um for and more people need to come to the realization that a lot of this content is out there and is easy for you to access. You just have to know how to go and find it. Yeah. Do you see libraries evolving? So I, I would say the curve is probably five years behind. You guys are pretty progressive, especially with like the Oculus and everything else like mm-hmm. that. In terms of social media, do you see the libraries systems developing a way to tap into like TikTok, Instagram, YouTube shorts, because people only have and I know this from my own trends, about 30 seconds of uh, attention span, especially oh, yeah. on the on the handheld devices. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned where I work, we're currently ahead of the curve. You're seeing that there's already social media marketing, whatnot, more getting on it. Um, I actually found the coronavirus pandemic um, brought forth that a lot more Okay, because uh, people can no longer have their printed flyers, what we call uh, um, our uh, four ups, which is when you just have a uh, standard eight and a half by 11 sheet. And you have a little, it's broken in the quarters of marketing material for like the book club and whatnot. Yeah. Um, you had to go to your online sources, the coronavirus, um, a lot more services had to be offered digitally. There was virtual story times and things like that. Uh, 
I think that evolution has begun, and to be fair, a bit before the coronavirus as well. But now libraries are realizing this is where we have to go. Um, teenagers, for example, are one of the hardest demographics to get within a library. Um, and I can't blame them either because teens feel unwanted in a lot of places they go to. They don't feel welcomed. Uh, but if you want to hit them, and it's not just them really anymore because now these adults we know are growing yeah. up with technology, growing up with social media. Yeah, I, I do think the evolution's coming. Um, it's still lagging behind in some ways. There are methods of giving people a heads up on the resources available in the library and the methods that they advertise it within the marketing. It can be kind of boring, still tame. Um, but then you see others that are learning, uh, you know, how do you catch people's eyes? How do you, how do you satisfy the algorithm so more people yeah. are going to see it? Uh, a while back, I saw this guy. It was fantastic. He um, has a big cowboy hat on, and he was talking like it was a library commercial that they made and they posted on all social media and he was doing it like a used car salesman and like it would cut really quickly to the wacky arm and play with two people <laughs> and just like the cadence of the way he was speaking and going across it it was um it got like over a million views which yeah. is huge from a you know public library where they probably did it with somebody's uh, smartphone sure um, you know they didn't have a nice professional setup for recording this but because of the uh how creative it was how innovative it was it reached a massive audience more and more are picking up on that kind of style, realizing you have to go viral to bring attention um, to your institution. And I think libraries are getting there. Um, the ones that are being supported continuously because they have, you kind of have to have an initial user base to be able to reach further. You know, you can't really go from zero to a thousand. You kind of have to start at 10 and then 10 can get to a thousand. Yeah, unless you have a philanthropist that drops down you know, which can have 100, 120 know. <laughs> million dollars to a you know library system. Yeah, absolutely. I would be interested to see, uh, just from an as aspect of, um, I respect your opinion a lot, especially like when it comes to books. Appreciate that. And I I think we like the same books and everything else like that. So if I ever had an interest in a book, I'd be like, hey, Brandon, what's a good book for me to read? Yeah. I, I think it'd be interesting to have like uh, my wife is reading this new series of books. It's like star moon and I don't know. I can show you it upstairs. It's about fairies and all this other stuff. It's a fantasy I'm sure romance. I'm familiar with it. It's been rented. It, it's so wanted that I literally bought her the books talking about saving money. Yeah. These books ain't, they're not cheap. No, they're not. Um, but I, I bought her the last two in the series because uh, of uh, three series and, um, Anyway, she had to return the, the second one when well, she wasn't done with it. And she's like, I'm never going to be able to read this again because <laughs> I'm on the wait list again and all yeah. this other stuff. Um, I think it'd be interesting from a library standpoint to have like you or someone else say like, hey, this book just came out. It's a great, you know, I read through it. It's a great read. This is basically what it's about. If it's something that interests you, come down to the local library and check it out. See, and you, you're saying that that's – um. Those kind of, I've heard those kind of things recommended too, and I like to see that direction go forward. The key part, though, is uh, you know what did you say at the beginning there? You know, um, I I like, yeah, uh, you like me, you know, you I trust me, your opinion, you, you respect yeah. my opinion. Um, that comes from you know trust building. That comes from time. That yeah. comes from us getting to know each other, having some genuine conversations of each other. Um, I'm sure there's some people though that they saw, let's say it's me again, but they don't know me. You know, some people might pick up on a vibe, that have an intrinsic <laughs> trust, and that they will go forward with it. But I think a lot of that, though, is um, you got to put in the groundwork. And from the professionals in the street, they have to earn that trust. That's fair. You know, you, ha yeah. you have to learn that their intentions are true. That you can you can like, tap into. Like, hey, are you into D&D? &D? Oh, Join goodness, me yeah. at this blah, 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 and this location. Know, and you want to know the person saying that is someone who knows what they're talking about. Yeah. You know, yeah, you yeah. don't want it to be somebody who's posing that they know what D&D &D is. You know, right. you say the – we were talking earlier. Say the words are – letters dm to them you know yeah. and they just have no idea what you're referring to there it's like, oh yeah okay did i clarify that earlier oh no i know what a dm is though okay so for the listeners if you're still listening in oh for that, uh yeah. it, it's a dungeon master yes and you might also hear gm yeah. um that you'll hear from tabletop gaming in general game master yep um yep. but we'll wrap this up man i appreciate your time and everything oh it's been my um, pleasure man it, it's been we already flew through an hour it's been an hour already and we blasted through it my goodness 
But uh, I appreciate you coming out, having dinner with my fam. Thank you. No, you're it was first, a pleasure. Like I said, you're the first guest that I've ever fed dinner to. It's an honor, an yeah. honor and a privilege. <laughs> yeah, I'll send you home with some elk. First time you ate elk. Yeah, my very first time. It was very good. Very yeah. good. I'll send you home with some ground elk. Ground elk. Yeah, absolutely. Take it. It was. It's so. true what I was reading too. I heard that it's uh, got a little bit of a sweeter taste to yeah. it than I just was comparing it to beef, as yeah. I figured it'd be the simplest comparison. Absolutely true. Delicious. Yeah. yeah. Well, right on, man. I'll have you back on. We'll we'll chat more about. Uh, yeah, crypto, you, now that you crypto. got a bit of a sense, I oh yeah, absolutely. We'll yeah, go into cryptids. a lot of things. I mean, I've got a jackalope tattooed on me. I'm we'll, super big into. Cryptids. We'll talk about the Mothman at times too. Oh yeah, yeah. No, All right, man. I can go into it. Right on. That's been a pleasure. Yep. All right, bye guys.